Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my own personal hell. As I continue my quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture, I find myself in the year 2016. And that year's winner was Hillary's America, The Secret History of the Democratic Party. And let's get this out of the way right now. Yes, this was the worst movie of that year. The Razzies got that one right. In fact, I have very few complaints about the Razzies that year. Though it was a bit odd that they had six nominations per category instead of their usual five, something they have not done before or since. They also awarded Misconduct the Barry L. Bumstead Award for a movie that cost a lot and lost a lot. But it only cost $11 million. By Hollywood standards, that's really not a lot. M. Night Shyamalan's latest movie cost more than that. But anyway, I wasn't exactly eager to take a second look at this movie. I didn't really want to look at it the first time. In case you can't tell, I'm not terribly excited to talk about this movie today. Oh, I can tell. Did I record that on two hours of sleep? I sound tired. But I am indeed going to revisit this documentary because this is my life now. And it's somehow worse than I remember. I'd forgotten about the awful musical choices, including a weird-ass arrangement of the Star-Spangled Banner that includes parts of the rarely heard second and third verses. No, not those parts. I'd forgotten how cheap the historical reenactments looked, especially those wigs. Holy shit, how did I overlook those in the original review? And I'd forgotten just how long it feels. It's about an hour and 45 minutes, but feels twice as long as D'Souza stumbles aimlessly from subject to subject, rarely coming close to anything resembling a point. If you haven't seen the movie, you're not missing anything, but here's the basic idea. The movie was made by right-wing political grifter and sentient pile of sewage Dinesh D'Souza, who has shat out several laughably bad books and movies that make money by telling his ignorant audience exactly what they want to hear. He used to spend a considerable amount of time on Twitter spewing out the dumbest takes on history and constantly getting dunked on by actual historians, which happened so often I started to wonder if he honestly had a humiliation kink. I have no idea if he still does this because honestly, I got bored with him after a while and I haven't really been paying close attention to his Twitter feed. You can only watch a man punch himself in the dick so many times before it gets old. D'Souza was convicted of campaign finance fraud when he tried to get around the maximum contribution limit for a Senate candidate by asking other people to contribute on his behalf and then reimbursing them, because apparently he does not understand the concept of a paper trail. He pleaded guilty and spent eight months in a halfway house. In the movie, he claims his conviction was political retaliation for his movie about Obama, which, like most of his claims, is laughably dishonest. But every once in a while, a bit of honesty creeps in. I think I might be the stupidest criminal in the history of American jurisprudence. Well, I'd say it's a toss-up between you and Elizabeth Holmes. And then he goes on an unbearably long tirade about the secret history of the Democratic Party, which contains exactly zero secrets. There's nothing in this movie you can't find on Wikipedia. You probably know most of it already if you have a high school diploma. And he uses the legitimately racist history of the Democratic Party to claim the Democrats are the real racists nowadays, not the Republicans. Because according to D'Souza, nothing has changed since the Democratic Party's founding. The Southern strategy never happened. And it doesn't matter how many times he gets dunked on by actual historians. He just keeps on spewing his bullshit and continues to claim he's right, even when historical record conclusively proves otherwise. And in this movie, he actually explains why he does this, albeit accidentally. There's a moment when he's in the halfway house where he recounts a conversation he may or may not have had with a con artist who once ran an insurance scam. The law eventually caught up to him, but even when the authorities started to close in on him and his crew, they held their ground. Never give up the con. Deny, deny, deny. He's using this as a metaphor for the Dems, but he's inadvertently telling on himself. He does that a lot, actually. And like a lot of conservative pundits, he has a tendency to tell stories about people that are supposed to make us hate them, but inadvertently end up making them sound kind of awesome. The film contains an excerpt from an interview with Saul Alinsky where he describes being poor and unable to afford a decent meal, so he figured out a way to con people out of free food and taught others how to do the same. I'm not sure what this has to do with anything, nor am I sure why I should hate him for this. People gotta eat. Desperate times and all. The right to eat takes precedence over the right to make a profit. I mean... Yeah. 
And considering this movie's title is Hillary's America, he spends a remarkably small amount of time talking about Hillary Clinton. And when he does, he trots out the same tired old conspiracy theories you've heard a thousand times before, along with a few new ones like Hillary encouraged Bill's infidelity. What evidence does he have for this? None whatsoever. But hey, never let the truth get in the way of a good grift. And that's basically the movie in a nutshell. It's as insufferable as it sounds, I assure you. But I don't feel like I can stop there. I said pretty much all I needed to say about Hillary's America the first time around, and I don't want to just repeat myself. I need some new material. So I decided to watch D'Souza's follow-up to Hillary's America, Death of a Nation. That was a mistake. This is yet another movie where he claims Democrats are the real racist because they're the party of slavery and the KKK, and Republicans were the party of Lincoln and civil rights, which only works if you ignore the fact that the modern KKK support Trump. To paraphrase Princeton history professor Kevin Cruz, the modern GOP claiming it's the party of civil rights because of Lincoln is like Pabst claiming their product is a blue ribbon beer because it won an award in 1893. And it's remarkable how often he repeats his own talking points. He talks about how Hitler and Mussolini were fans of FDR, which obviously didn't last. He mentions Margaret Sanger. He again plays the victim card by talking about his conviction for campaign finance fraud. He brings up President Woodrow Wilson's screening Birth of a Nation in the White House. He talks about slave owner and one of America's greatest assholes, President Andrew Jackson. Remind me, who said he was a big admirer of Jackson? Good lord, this is too easy. And he repeats his claim that racists switching from Democrat to Republican in the 1960s didn't happen because only two Democratic congressmen changed parties. Not that it matters because the real metric for party shift is voters who switch sides, not congressmen. But just for the record, it wasn't two, it was 30. And some of the examples he gives of congressmen who did not switch sides either chose not to run for re-election or died. Kinda hard to switch parties if they're dead, jackass. So yeah, it turns out if you've seen one Dinesh D'Souza movie, you've seen them all. It's remarkable how close this is to literally being the exact same movie as Hillary's America. But he does cover some new ground, and it's no less infuriating. The poster might lead you to believe that he's going to focus on Lincoln and Trump, but much like the Clintons in Hillary's America, he only briefly touches on Lincoln and Trump, and it's kind of hilarious. Lincoln was a Republican president, and the Democrats called him an extremist and an authoritarian. So you see, Donald J. Trump is exactly like Abraham Lincoln. Wow, excellent routine. That is going to get some high marks for sure. While we're waiting on the judges, we'd like to remind you we still have plenty of action coming up in our mental gymnastics competition, including Christians who hate socialism, pro-lifers who support the death penalty, and calling for the eradication of transgenderism isn't the same as calling for the eradication of transgender people. Wow, Mr. Knowles is clearly going for a high level of difficulty there. We'll see if it pays off. Dinesh also talks about how the left reacted to Trump's win, saying they tried to overturn the election and resorted to violence. It is amazing just how poorly this movie has aged in the wake of January 6th. And that's not the only aspect of the movie that hasn't aged well. He disputes any claims of President Richard Nixon's racism, stating Nixon never said anything racist during a campaign, which is rather specific. Just because he didn't say it during a campaign doesn't mean he didn't say it in private. And thanks to some audio recordings that have since been made public, including a phone call between Nixon and then-Governor of California, Ronald Reagan, we know for a fact he did. I won't repeat what either man said. I will simply say that I have never felt a stronger urge to piss on both of their graves. And that urge was already pretty strong. Anyway, Dinesh mentions Antifa a few times, repeatedly mispronouncing it Antifa. You're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable, dummy. And of course, this leads to the right's favorite boogeyman and supposed benefactor of Antifa, George Soros, with clips from an interview he did with Steve Croft for 60 Minutes that D'Souza uses to criticize what Soros did to survive the Holocaust and Christ Almighty, is that ever not your fucking place? And what kills me about this is it's not like there aren't legitimate criticisms of George Soros. In that same interview, he claims to want more financial regulation. But as Croft points out, much of his business operates offshore to avoid regulation. That seems like a contradiction worth examining. But Dinesh doesn't care about any of that. Instead, he focuses on shit like this. Are you religious? No. Do you believe in God? No. Judging a man by his religious beliefs, are we? But please, tell me again how the Democrats are the real bigots. 
And speaking of the Holocaust, most of this movie talks about the history of the German Nazi party and tries to equate them with modern day Democrats. It's somehow more inept than I thought it would be. And not just because the acting is laughably terrible. There's a bit near the end of the movie that focuses on Sophie Scholl, an activist who was caught delivering anti-war leaflets and executed by the Nazis. For some reason, this is the only part of the movie where the Germans speak English instead of German with English subtitles. And the performance by this Nazi officer is, well, how dare you speak against the Fuhrer? Oh my god. I'm not the only one getting Jupiter Ascending vibes, right? I create life! And I destroy it. Anyway, first D'Souza claims socialism is bad because the Nazi party campaigned on social programs, ignoring the fact that pretty much every German political party at the time did the same thing, and the fact that most Democrats in Washington are not socialists. And he includes interviews with a few academics and historians like Robert Paxton, former head of Columbia University's history department, and the man who literally wrote the book on fascism. While the interview initially appears to support Dinesh's arguments, Paxton has since stated he was interviewed under false pretenses and is comments were taken out of context. But you don't need to hear that from him, you simply need to look at how the movie is edited. There's no pro-slavery philosophy that works into the founding. The founders took specific measures. If you ask someone a question and their response is clearly and obviously cut off while they're in mid-sentence, it's a pretty clear sign that you're misrepresenting their statements. And it is true that Paxton, at the time, considered Trump to be a right-wing populist and not a fascist. But he has since re-evaluated his position and now considers Trump to be a fascist. Yet another part of this movie that has not aged well. D'Souza also has a tendency to contradict himself as he initially claims the Nazis were socialists, but later in the movie refers to them as state capitalists, which is not the same thing. It's also a more accurate description of the Nazis. Just because they called themselves the National Socialist Party doesn't mean they were actually socialists. I can call myself the Queen of France, it wouldn't mean anything. He also claims to disagree with those on the left who say America has a history of white supremacy, while at the same time showing how the Nazis modeled their own white supremacist policies after America, which is sadly very true. But this sort of contradiction is par for the course. These are the same type of people who refuse to hear any criticism of America and insist this country is great, while at the same time following a man whose campaign slogan is, Make America Great Again. Which is only possible if it's not great now. Coming up next on our mental gymnastics competition, D'Souza also gets into some really weird territory when he tries to claim Hitler was not anti-gay as he has often been portrayed. Correctly. To support this claim, he brings up Hitler's association with known homosexual Ernst Röhm, while showing Hitler arresting Röhm during the Night of the Long Knives. Wait, what? And I really don't understand where he's going with this. Are you trying to rehabilitate Hitler's image? Or are you suggesting not being anti-gay is bad? It doesn't bode well either way, but what are you trying to say, man? But as confusing as this is, it's not the worst bit. The biggest unforced error in this entire mess of a documentary is D'Souza's interview with, of all people, Richard Spencer. Yes, that Richard Spencer. I honestly have no idea what D'Souza was trying to accomplish here. D'Souza points out, correctly, that Spencer's cry of Hail Trump sounds a little too similar to Heil Hitler. And Spencer is a self-avowed right-wing white supremacist. He appears to be sabotaging his own argument that the real racists are on the left. Though he tries, and fails, to steer Spencer in that direction by pointing out people like Andrew Jackson and James Polk, who Spencer admires, were Democrats. Well, if an avowed racist supports a Republican president today and more closely identifies with a Democratic president of old, that's a pretty clear sign that a paradigm shift occurred at some point. This is like someone claiming the Earth is flat and then, as evidence of their claim, they point to a globe. I'm completely baffled by the fact that D'Souza not only chose to do this interview in the first place, but included it in the movie. He is destroying his own argument right before my very eyes. And the only conclusion I can come to is he's either too dumb to realize what he's doing, or he thinks his audience is. I've never seen anything like it. It might be funny if it wasn't so jaw-droppingly stupid. Look, I could go on and on about Death of a Nation and what makes D'Souza's movies terrible in general, but I think you have the idea by now. 
The reenactments are very cheaply done and have terrible acting. The movies are entirely too long and would be considerably shorter if D'Souza didn't spend so much time filming himself walking around in empty locations. Seriously, he does that a lot. It's weird. And his arguments are laughably inept, which is what really makes his movie so frustrating to sit through. I almost didn't make it through Death of a Nation, but I toughed it out and you goddamn well better appreciate what I do for you people. I sit through this crap so you don't have to. And believe me, you don't have to. There's not much to laugh at here. It's just trash and it's not worth your time. And just to reiterate what I said in my original review of Hillary's America, I am not trying to suggest the Democrats are good or that you should be a Democrat. I'm not. I'm merely suggesting Dinesh D'Souza is a terrible filmmaker, and his arguments for why you should be a Republican are complete nonsense. And I hope I never have to see another one of his terrible movies again. 2,000 Mules didn't win anything, right? No? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Next time, we're going to look at the first animated movie to ever win Worst Picture. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and kids... Never listen to Dinesh D'Souza. Oh yeah, that's real smart, mm-hmm.